Uh, I want to read from, so undoubtedly there will be variants as I go, I will interpolate, from the final sections of my rather long chapter on Hamlet, because after all, Hamlet of all of Shakespeare's plays is the one which is most certainly a universal possession. Perhaps I might move this just a little, my dears, if it will move. Hamlet now seems no more fictive than Montaigne. Four centuries have established both as authentic personalities, rather in the same way that Falstaff appears to be as historical a reality as Rabelais. Western culture, if it is to survive its current self-hatred, must become only more Hamlet-like. We have no equally powerful and influential image of human cognition pushed to its limits. Plato's Socrates comes closest. Both think too well to survive. Socrates, at least in Montaigne's version, almost becomes a pragmatic alternative to Jesus. Hamlet's relation to Jesus is enigmatic. Shakespeare, as always, evades both faith and doubt. Since the Jesus of the Gospel of Mark, like the Yahweh of the J writer, is a literary character now worshiped as God, I speak only pragmatically. I do not speak to dissuade anyone from such worship. We have the riddle that Hamlet can be discussed in some of the ways we might employ to talk about Yahweh or Socrates or Jesus. University teachers of what once we called literature no longer regard dramatic and literary characters as real. This does not matter at all since common readers and playgoers and common believers rightly continue to quest for personality. It is idle to warn them against the errors of identifying with Hamlet or with Jesus or with Yahweh. Shakespeare's most astonishing achievement, however unintended, is to have made available in Hamlet a universal instance of our will to identity. Hamlet, to some of us, offers the hope of a purely secular transcendence, but to others he intimates the spirit's survival in more traditional modes. Perhaps Hamlet has replaced Plato's and Montaigne's Socrates as the intellectual's Christ. W.H. Auden disagreed and said he preferred Falstaff for that role. But I cannot see, Mr. Auden was a grander humorist than myself, <laughs> and an old friend, I should ask, whom I, I should add, whom I miss. But I cannot see the defiant Sir John in love with freedom above all as atoning for anyone. The largest enigma of Hamlet is the aura of transcendence he emanates, even at his most violent, capricious, and insane moments. Some critics have rebelled against Hamlet, insisting that he is at best a hero villain, but they blow the sand against the wind, and the wind blows it back again. You cannot demystify Hamlet. The sinuous enchantment has gone on too long. He has the place among fictive characters that Shakespeare occupies among writers, the center of centers. No actor that I have seen, not even Sir John Gielgud <coughs> many decades ago, has usurped the role of Hamlet to the exclusion of all others. Is this centrality only a back formation of cultural history, or is it implicit in Shakespeare's text? Hamlet and Western self-consciousness have been the same for about the last two centuries of romantic sensibility. There are many signs now 
that global self-consciousness increasingly identifies with Hamlet, Asia and Africa included. The phenomenon may no longer be cultural in the sense that rock music and blue jeans constitute international culture. Hamlet, the prince more than the play, has become myth. Gossip matured into legend. As with Falstaff, we can say more aptly what Hamlet is not than what he is. He ends a quietist rather than a man of active faith. But his passivity itself is a mask for something inexpressible, though it can be suggested. It is not his earlier nihilism which foregrounds the play. And yet it is hardly a purposiveness even in playing. The stage at the close is strewn with clues as well as corpses. Why does Hamlet care about his posthumous reputation? He is never more passionate than when he commands Horatio to go on living, not for pleasure and despite the pain of existence, only in order to ensure that his prince not bear a wounded name. Not until the end does the audience matter to Hamlet. He needs us to give honor and meaning to his death. His story must be told, and not just to Fortinbras. And it must be reported by Horatio, who alone knows it truly. Does Horatio then understand what we do not? Hamlet, as he dies, loves nobody. Not father or mother, Ophelia or Yurik. But he knows that Horatio loves him. The story can only be told by someone who accepts Hamlet totally beyond judgment. And despite the moral protests of some critics, Hamlet has had his way. It is we who are Horatio. And the world mostly has agreed to love Hamlet despite his crimes and blunders, despite even his brutal, pragmatically murderous, unforgivable treatment of Ophelia. We forgive Hamlet precisely as we forgive ourselves. I see that I have italicized that in my text. And even though it is, I think, a dangerous sentence for me and for all of us, I will repeat it. We forgive Hamlet precisely as we forgive ourselves. Though we know we are not Hamlet, since our consciousness cannot extend as far as his does. Yet we worship, in a secular way, this all but infinite consciousness. What we have called Romanticism was engendered by Hamlet, though it required two centuries before the prince's self-consciousness became universally prevalent, and almost a third century before Nietzsche insisted that Hamlet possessed true knowledge and insight into the horrible truth, which is the abyss between mundane reality and the Dionysian rapture of an endlessly ongoing consciousness. Nietzsche was fundamentally right. Horatio is a Stoic. Hamlet is not. The audience, like its surrogate, Horatio, is more or less Christian, and perhaps far more Stoic than not. Hamlet, toward the close, employs some Christian vocabulary, but he swerves from Christian comfort into a Dionysian consciousness, and his New Testament citations become deliberately strong misreadings of both Protestant and Catholic understandings of the text. Had he but time, Hamlet says, he could tell us. But what? Death intervenes, and we receive the clue in his next words, let it be. Let be has become Hamlet's refrain and has a quietistic force uncanny in its suggestiveness. 
He will not unpack his heart with words, since only his thoughts, not their ends, are his own. And yet there is something far from dead in his heart, something ready or willing, strong beyond the weakness of flesh. When Jesus spoke kindly to the sleep-prone Simon Peter, Jesus did not say that the readiness was all, since Jesus' stance was, as he said, for Yahweh alone, and only Yahweh was all. For Hamlet, there is nothing but the readiness, which translates as a willingness to let everything be, not out of trust in Yahweh, but through a confidence in a final consciousness. That consciousness sets aside both Jesus' Pharisaic trust in the resurrection of the body and also the skeptical reality principle of annihilation. Let be is a setting aside. It is neither denial nor affirmation. What Hamlet could tell us is his achieved awareness of what he himself has come to represent, a dramatist apprehension of what it means to incarnate the tragedy one cannot compose. Falstaff, in Shakespeare's lifetime, seems to have been more popular even than Hamlet. The centuries since have preferred the prince not only to the fat knight, but to every other fictive being whatsoever. Hamlet's universalism seems our largest clue to the enigma of his personality. The less Hamlet cares for anyone, including the audience, the more we care for him. It seems to me the world's oddest love affair. Jesus returns our love, and yet Hamlet cannot. Hamlet's blocked affections, diagnosed by Dr. Freud as Oedipal, actually reflect a transcendental quietism for which, happily, we lack a label. Hamlet is beyond us, and I emphasize that beyond. Beyond everyone else in Shakespeare or in literature, unless indeed you agree with me in finding the Yahweh of the J writer and the Jesus of the Gospel of Mark, at least initially, to be literary characters. When we reach King Lear, we understand that Hamlet's beyondness has to do with the mystery of kingship, so dear to Shakespeare's then patron, King James I. But we have great trouble seeing Hamlet as a potential king. And very few playgoers and readers tend to agree with Fortinbras's judgment that the prince would have joined Hamlet Sr. and Fortinbras as another great royal basher of heads. Clearly, Hamlet's sublimity is a question of personality. Four centuries have so understood it. Hamlet's linguistic skepticism coexists with a span and control of language greater even than my hero Falstaff's. It cost me some sadness to admit that. Because the range of Hamlet's language is the widest we have ever encountered in a single work. It is always a great shock for me to be reminded that Shakespeare used more than 21,000 separate words. Not even Joyce employed 21,000 separate words. While Racine may do splendidly with fewer than 2,000. Doubtless some German scholar has counted up just how many of the 21,000 words Hamlet had in his vocabulary, but we scarcely need to know the exact sum. The play is much Shakespeare's longest because Hamlet speaks so much of it, and I frequently wish it even longer, so that Hamlet could have spoken on even more matters than he already covers. Falstaff, monarch of wit, nevertheless is something short of an authorial consciousness in his own right. Hamlet burst through that barrier, and not just when he revises the murder of Gonzago into the mousetrap, but almost invariably as he comments upon all things between heaven and earth. G. Wilson Knight once admirably characterized Hamlet as death's ambassador to us. No other literary character speaks with the authority of the undiscovered country, except for Marx, Jesus. The copiousness of Hamlet's 
language utilizes the full and unique resources of English syntax and diction. Hamlet's language is marked by amazing mood shifts. His linguistic decorum is astonishing. It makes startling leaps from high to low with immense mutability of cognition and affect. I myself always am struck by the varied and perpetual ways in which Hamlet keeps overhearing himself speak. No one else in literature is so acutely self-conscious. This is not just a question of rhetoricity or word consciousness. It is the essence of Shakespeare's greatest originalities in the representation of character, of thinking, and of personality. The triple basis of rhetoric, psychology, and cosmology all bewilder us in Hamlet, because Hamlet changes with each and every self-overhearing. It is a valuable commonplace that the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, is an overwhelmingly theatrical play. Hamlet himself is even more consciously, self-consciously, forgive me, theatrical than Falstaff tends to be. Falstaff is more consistently attentive to his audience, both on stage and off. And yet Falstaff, though he vastly amuses himself, plays much less to himself than Hamlet does. The difference, I think, stems from Falstaff's authentic playfulness. Like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, Falstaff is homo ludens, while anxiety totally dominates Hamlet. Yet the difference seems still greater. The counter Machiavel, Hamlet, could almost be called an anti-Marlovian character, whereas Falstaff simply renders Marlowe's mode totally irrelevant. My favorite Marlovian hero villain, whom like Falstaff I've always wanted to play on a stage, Barabbas, the wicked Jew of Malta, is a self-delighting fantastic. But being a cartoon, like nearly all Marlovian protagonists, he frequently speaks as though his words were wrapped up in a cartoonist balloon floating above his head. Hamlet is something radically new, even for and in Shakespeare. Hamlet's theatricality is dangerously nihilistic because it is so paradoxically natural to him. More even than his parody, Ham, in Beckett's Endgame, Hamlet is a walking mousetrap, embodying the anxious expectations that are incarnating the malaise of Elsinore. Iago says, that he is nothing if not critical. But Hamlet is criticism itself, the theatrical interpreter of his own story. When the coming subtler than any other dramatist before or since, Shakespeare does not let us be absolutely certain as to just which lines Hamlet himself has inverted in order to revise the murder of Gonzago into the mousetrap. Hamlet speaks of writing some 12 or 16 lines but we come to suspect that there are rather more, and that they include the extraordinary speech in which the player king tells us that ethos is not the daimon, that character is not fate, but only accident, and that eros itself is the purest accident. We know that Shakespeare acted the ghost of Hamlet's father. It would have been expedient if the same actor rendered the part of the player king, another representation of the dead father. There would be a marvelous twist to Shakespeare himself intoning lines that his Hamlet can be expected to have written. And I want to recite the great speech of the player king. Purpose is but the slave to memory, a violent birth but poor validity, which now the fruit unripe sticks on the tree, but fall unshaken when they mellow be. Most necessary it is that we forget to pay ourselves what to ourselves is debt. What to ourselves in passion we propose, the passion ending doth the purpose lose. The violence of either grief or joy, their own enactures with themselves destroy. 
Where joy most revels, grief doth most lament. Grief joy, joy grieves on slender accident. And then suddenly he opens it up. This world is not for I, nor tis not strange that even our loves should with our fortunes change. For tis a question left us yet to prove whether love lead fortune or else fortune love. The great man down, you mark his favorite flies. The poor advanced makes friends of enemies. And hitherto doth love on fortune tend, for who not needs shall never lack a friend. And who in want a hollow friend doth try, directly seasons him his enemy. But orderly to end where I begun, our wills and fates do so contrary run, that our devices still are overthrown, our thoughts are ours, their ends none of our own. How any audience could have taken in these 26 closely packed lines of a psychologized metaphysic through the ear alone, I scarcely know. They are as dense and weighted as any passage in Shakespeare. The plot of the mousetrap does not require them, and I assume that Hamlet composed them as his key signature, as what that other melancholy Dane Kierkegaard called the point of view of my work as an author. They center upon their final lines. Our wills and fates do so contrary run that our devices still are overthrown. Our thoughts are ours, their ends none of our own. Our devices are our intended purposes, products of our wills. But our fates are antithetical to our characters, and what we think to do has no relation to our thoughts. I grant that you don't need to be a formalist or a historicist to assert that being true to Hamlet or to Falstaff is a nonsensical quest. If you read or attend Shakespeare in order to improve your neighbor or your neighborhood, then doubtless I am being nonsensical, a kind of Don Quixote of literary criticism. The late novelist Anthony Burgess, of whom I was very fond, in his Nothing Like the Sun, a wonderful novel about Shakespeare, has the bard make a fine, somewhat Nietzschean remark, tragedy is a goat and comedy a village preopus, and dying is the word that links both. Hamlet and Falstaff would have said it better, but the sexual play on dying is redemptive of the prose, and we are well reminded that Shakespeare writ no genre and used poor Polonius to scorn those who did. Aldous Huxley once said that tragedy must omit the whole truth. Yet Shakespeare refutes Huxley. John Webster wrote Revenge Tragedy. Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. There are no personalities in Webster, though nearly everyone manages to die with something like an imitation of Shakespearean eloquence. Life must be true to Shakespeare if personality is to have value, is to be value. Value and pathos do not commune easily with each other, yet who but Shakespeare has reconciled them so incessantly? What, after all, is personality? A dictionary would say it is the quality that renders one a person, not a thing or an animal, or else an assemblage of characteristics that somehow makes one distinctive. That is not very helpful, particularly in regard to Hamlet or Falstaff, mere roles for actors, as formalists go on telling us, and perhaps players fall in love with roles. But do we, if we never mount a stage, what do we mean by the personality of Jesus? Whether we think of the Gospel of Mark or of the American Jesus, or what might we mean by the personality of God, whether we think of the Yahweh, of the Jay Rider, or of the American God, so notoriously fond of Republicans and of neoconservatives. <laughs> I submit that we know better what it is we mean when we speak of the personality of Hamlet as opposed to the personality of our best friend or the personality of some favorite celebrity. Shakespeare persuades us that we know something in Hamlet that is the best and innermost part of him, something uncreated, 
that goes back farther than our earliest memories of ourselves. And so I come to my conclusion. Every student of the imagery of the play Hamlet has brooded on the imposthume, I-M-P-O-S-T-H-U-N, an abscess, a wound on the imposthume or abscess, which the poet Robert Browning was to pun on brilliantly with his, the imposthume I prove to relieve thee of vanity. Hamlet himself, precursor of so many Browning personae, may be punning on the abscess as an imposture when he says, this is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. Elsinore's disease is anywheres, anytimes. Something is rotten in every state. Something, after all, <laughs> that we need not um, dwell upon. And if your sensibility is like Hamlet's, then finally you will not tolerate it. Hamlet's tragedy is at last the tragedy of personality. The charismatic is compelled to a physician's authority despite himself. Claudius is merely an accident. Hamlet's only persuasive enemy is Hamlet himself. When Shakespeare broke away from Marlovian cartooning and so became Shakespeare, he prepared the abyss of Hamlet for himself. Not less than everything in himself, Hamlet also knows himself to be nothing in himself. He can and does repair to that nothing at sea. And he returns disinterested or nihilistic or quietistic, whichever you may prefer. But Hamlet dies with great concern for his wounded name, as if re-entering the maelstrom of Elsinore partly undoes that great change, but only in part. The transcendental music of cognition rises up again in a celebratory strain at the close of Hamlet's tragedy, achieving the secular triumph of the rest is silence. What is not at rest or what abides before the silence is the idiosyncratic value of Hamlet's personality for which another term has now become the canonical sublime. Thank you all very much.